So without further ado, we're going to get right on to our questions because we want to hear all about what they have to say. My first question will be to Congresswoman Catherine. Um, we're going to first ask you, who inspired you to run for public office? You must get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly did on the, on the campaign trail. And thank you, Rondella. And thank you to Northeastern and my uh, panelists, Linda and Jennifer. I'm thrilled to be here. It's a beautiful sight from our vantage point. All these really young is. women. It's, uh, it's all and right. Men. And men. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. No um, but really, uh, my beginning in elected office was, um, it was really nothing I considered. Uh, I didn't consider uh, running. It just wasn't anything that came into my mind. But I was very interested in education policy issues. And there were eight people running for nine open seats on my local school committee. And so that seemed like good odds. A uh, very unrisky <laughs> way to uh, become involved. I had just moved to Melrose out of uh, the city of Boston and wanted to be more involved in the community. Uh, so I encourage everyone to run in local office. Um, but uh, you also have to be careful the snowball it starts. But it really, my grandmother is um, the person who inspired me. And she never worked outside of the home. Uh, she was a homemaker. She was very involved in her church. But she just was ahead of her time. And she was always um, calling in to talk radio, trying to disguise her voice. <laughs> and then all the women of the Altar Guild would say, yeah, I'm named after her. Catherine, was that you? And you know, but she just was an inclusive person who never had much materially or financially in her life, but she felt like she was the wealthiest person. So she just really always talked about giving back and how you give back. And she loved politics. Uh, and so every Sunday night, we went to her house for dinner. And I really didn't think it had rubbed off in the way that it did. But my dad was the, you know, the Republican. And my grandmother was the Democrat. And they would really go at it. Um, and they loved each other dearly. So I think they also were their relationship an inspiration for bipartisan cooperation. I know it can be done. <laughs> in, uh, Thank Congress you, Catherine. As well. <laughs> Senator, who inspired you? What made you want to run for public office? Well, first, thank you for having me. Thank you, Northeastern. And I'm happy to be on this panel um, with these incredible women. I would say that um, somewhat like Congressman, uh, Congresswoman Clark, that you know my family, right? I did not think that I would ever run for office. This is not something that I came into dreaming of, um, putting my name on the ballot. I, went to, I was at um, the Carroll School of Management at BC, but I was always involved in my community. I grew up in Dorchester, and I saw firsthand in my home, um, my parents immigrated to this incredible country, and in the process, they had their children. But as my relatives, my aunts and uncles would live with us. So I'm really loud. I really don't need this microphone, actually. No. <laughs> so everyone would live with us. It was awesome. But once my blood relatives left, the first floor apartment became available, and so my parents opened it up for other Haitian families who did not have relatives in Boston. And they opened it up so they could live there and get assimilated into this new culture. So this is what I saw growing up, that you have to reach back and help those who may not be able to help themselves. And so that's how I kind of um, grew up in seeing that you have to be responsible for one another. But I can tell you that I worked in the public sector for almost nine and a half years. Um, I worked for a great state representative, Charlotte Gola Ritchie, even working as her legislative aide, still did not think of running for office and went to work for the city. And I would say that, you know, studies have shown, and, and the congresswoman and Jennifer knows this, that you have to ask a woman at least nine times mm -hmm. to yeah. run for office before we decide to run, right? So, Rondella, are you going to run? <laughs> <laughs> Rondella, you need to run. You know. Okay, that's twice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you need to run and run and run, right? So, like, eight times, it's ridiculous. But how many times do you have to ask a man? Never, right? It's once. Right. Right. <laughs> no, but it's true. And so, um, so that's something we have to be able to get over in terms of being able to run. But also really came from the support of my husband. And I think that's important in terms of the spouses that we have. 
So even though I had nine and a half years in the public sector, did not think of running, is when Speaker Tom Finneran decided he was not going to run for re-election. Um, our good friend, now mayor of the city, Mayor Walsh, was a rep for 17 years, called up my husband and said, Speaker Finneran's not going to run. Who do you think should run for the seat? And this is now where I live. And my husband said, well, this is Linda's seat. Linda should run. But my son is 16 months old on my hip, right? I'm like a young mom. And I'm like, what, are you crazy? I'm not going to put my name on the ballot. So really, um, that's how it kind of all started. And here I am now. That's a great story. 10 years great. later. That's a great story. Thank you. Three children. <laughs> Additional, right? Jennifer, what are some of the life lessons you've learned throughout your career? Oh, boy. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for having me here. And I am the most honored to be here because I'm with these esteemed women. And I've watched both of their careers. And even though we're on different sides of the aisle politically, I've known both of them for years. And I was so excited to be able to do this panel with them because they are two of my favorite women in politics. Um, so lessons I have learned. Uh, and again, like the senator, I also am very loud. So I'm sorry if I'm reverberating off the <laughs> deck walls. Um, one is to be true to yourself. You know, there's a lot of people out there, um, and they want you to be something that you're not necessary that you're not. And you need to be comfortable with who you are. You need to be comfortable with the decisions that you make, and be unwavering. If you take a position, don't flounder, because the most unattractive thing for a politician or for anyone in the public eye is to say one thing and then backtrack and then go back to it and backtrack, hold your line, and just be confident in your decision. Um, the next thing would be keep your friends close, your enemies closer. <laughs> it's like Julius Caesar, there's always someone who's waiting in the wings to stab you in the back. Keep an eye on that person. But the friendships that you do make in politics, and I have a couple of friends in the audience that I've made through campaigns and just throughout my career in politics, those are the most valuable friendships because really it's so hard, and especially as a woman in this business, it's so hard to find other women who do what you do every day, day in, day out, and to know that they've got your back. And even if you don't see each other for months, you, need, you have someone you can complain to and can talk to. So that'd be number two. Um, and my, my third one would be to make time for you. Whether it's you want to exercise, you want to go grab a cup of coffee with some friends or grab a drink, or you just want to shut your phone off and watch old Desperate Housewives reruns <laughs> or whatever it is, you should take the time for you because no one is going to ever give you that time. And no offense to all the men here, but you know, the guys sit and they watch the foot, their football games or their baseball games or whatever else, and we as women, especially for the three of us where we have numerous children, children between yeah. all of us. You never have time for you. Make some time for yourself. Hear you, hear you. I can hear okay. that. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like with more women in politics, you build a bigger sisterhood, which brings us up to leadership. Catherine, how can we improve gender balance? There are 104 women in Congress, an all-time record, but female members only account for 20% when we comprise of more than 50% of the US population. Women account for 24% of state legislatures and hold six governorships, leaving us lagging behind women's political participation in Afghanistan, Ethiopia, and Nepal. What can be done to address this persistent problem? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I really I believe so firmly that our democracy is stronger when our representatives reflect our country. And our country's demographics are, are not reflected in Congress, certainly not in the amount of women, certainly not in the amount of representatives in the House who are people of color. So we need that diversity because that's who we are as a people, and people should be able to see that in their leaders. So I think really it goes back to a point that Linda made about asking women to run. Uh, I just had a meeting before I came here, and it was about, well, do I have the qualifications? Mm -hmm. And it is a extremely qualified woman to run for office, any office. That, but that is a question that women really want everything to be together mm -hmm. and to be um, 
you know, tick off these boxes, make sure they have the degrees and the, you know, the experience, and you just don't see, and it's not that it's bad, you just don't see men often going through that same painstaking process. So I just encourage women to run, and women get encouraged by other women running and by people asking them, you know, ask your neighbor, um, consider it. You know, there's a lot of ways to serve your community, and there's a lot of cynicism around elected officials, but there's a lot of great, um, great people who are involved, and we need, especially in younger people, for that same involvement and to really consider elected politics as a career choice and a great way to become involved. So. I don't, I you know, we've just got to, we've got to keep asking. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mom never wrote a political check before she, before I ran yeah. for office. But once she got involved, and these are not big checks, but wow, does she love it. She's like, I have found my power. Because, you know, <laughs> she's just like, oh, what are you doing? And I, I had to sort through her email. And I'm like, oh my gosh, mom. You know, it's like, funny. it's kind of crazy. But, you know, it's supporting people, whether you're volunteering yeah. or going door to door. Support those candidates. And uh, it, it really does make a difference. Anyone can do it. Jennifer, I know you've worked a lot on this, but why in particular do you think there are so few Republican women in Congress? The number of Democratic women has continued to climb to approximately 33%, while Republican women to Congress has leveled off since hitting 10% during the mid-2000s. Yep. Well, we did elect a couple of new good Republican women to Congress, which was great. Um, and I think they're superstars and hopefully we'll pull other people with them. It is a huge problem and uh, like Congressman Clark was saying, so I think one of the problems is all the blue states are around Washington, D.C. And so it's really hard to, we see a lot of more conservative women who are running for office. They don't live in those blue states, they live far away. The women who are around the blue states have to compete against other really good, strong women who may, may not have many different views than they have. It's very difficult to get a conservative from Massachusetts to, <laughs> to win anything, <laughs> let alone to become a congresswoman from the state. Um, so, and then you, you, know, you start having family pressure. So, you know, the closer you live to DC, you could get home fast. You can jump on the shuttle, you can get back to New York, you can get back to Boston, you can get to Florida, you start moving across the country. I think women have, in addition to needing to be asked nine, ten times, you then have the pressure of, okay, well, if you're uh, Congresswoman Mick Morris Rogers, who lives in Washington State, that's a really long flight to take from Washington, D.C. to Washington State if your kid is sick. And you can move them around when they're small, but as they get older, you can't do that. So I think that's one of the problems. I think another problem is, really, I mean, we're the grand old party. We have had a lot of men in leadership. And maybe, you know, there's definitely a switch. Again, Congresswoman McMorris Rogers is now in leadership, and she's one of the top four, which is wonderful. But it took a really long time to get to the point where we had mm -hmm. a woman or a few women with strong, powerful voices who have said, I need to be in leadership, and, and I you know, would like to look at you know, the possibility of rising up the, the ladder here. Um, also, the National Party had been headed by a lot of men that weren't really accommodating to other women, and it was always a male chairman and a female vice chair. And our current chairman, who is my age, um, has his co-chair, instead of her being a vice chair, <coughs> excuse me, she's his, he calls her his co-chair. Mm -hmm. And so she's out there speaking just as much as he is. Mm -hmm. And so I think you, you will see a change. It just, Rome wasn't built in a day. It will take a little while for it to happen. Okay. Linda, what would you characterize, how would you characterize the progress women have made in public office in, in say, the last decade? I mean, I would say we have made some progress. No doubt um, the percentage points are still low. I would say here in Massachusetts, it's the first time in our history that um, the majority of the constitutional officers are women. If you take um, Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito, 
Um, you have Attorney General Moore Healy. You have um, Treasurer Deb Goldberg and the state auditors re-elected Suzanne Bump. And obviously the other two um, is Governor Charlie Baker and Bill Galvin, Secretary of State. So I think we, no doubt we still have more work to do. Mm -hmm. And I would say in terms of the legislature itself, 25% of the legislature um, you know, is made up of women out of 200, so 160 state reps, 40 state senators. We actually have a representative here, Representative Kane, um, who was just elected um, in a special election um, for Representative Mark Beaton's, right? Yep. Matt, Matt Beaton's seat, who's now Secretary of the Environment and Energy, so she did it. She, 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 she. <laughs> but I do want to just piggyback really quick that you know, it's about getting out there and deciding to run, but more importantly, on a grassroots level, that you all, in, in terms of the students at Northeastern University, you are gonna live in communities outside of Northeastern, right? When you graduate Northeastern, or even as you're here as students, you have an opportunity to play a role. As we said, it's whether in campaigns on the Democrat or Republican side to volunteer, to knock doors, but when you settle in a community, I think it's important to show up because there are civic associations that are happening every month. I represent the first Suffolk district, which is South Boston, Dorchester, Mattapan, and High Park. And literally, we have about 45 meetings that happen every month, right? It's neighbors getting together, talking about the issues. We have the Boston police show up, community policing to talk about issues that are taking place. So that's important. Knowing your neighbors is important, right? Getting involved in the community where you're deciding to settle is, ve is very critical because it shows folks, even though you may not be ready now to run, right, that you care where you live, right? You know who lives to the left and the right of you and across the street from you. You say hello to people that are walking your street, right? It's being accountable to one another. And so I think, you know, we've made some progress, but we got some, we have some work to do. That's right. Uh, Catherine, what role do you think the media plays in shaping perceptions of women in public office? And I won't take anything personal. <laughs> <laughs> we love media, Randall. <laughs> oh, such a tricky question. Uh, um, well, I often, uh, in fact, just driving over here as we were trying to find a place to park and uh, we were sort of going over speed bumps and it just turned into very comical and all these students are looking at us like, where are you? And, uh, <laughs> My friend and staffer Lauren said, "We're having a Veep moment." And, uh, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> I do often find it sort of interesting and alarming how much my staff loves that show. Like, oh, <laughs> but um, I think that um, I think it's tough. I think there are different standards. I think mm -hmm. there is a a different emphasis on how you look. I have gotten questions on. How could I, from you know, local coverage and uh, on how, how could you possibly do this with three children at home? You know, I, I don't remember anyone ever mm -hmm. asking uh, any of my other, you know, they all had children. Some of them had infants at home. I can only imagine, as we saw with Governor Jane Swift, mm -hmm. you know, if you have infants at home, the questions you would get. Mm -hmm. um, I do think. It, you know, the media's looking for a story, but there's also still um, some real stereotypes about women's role and women's role in government and in elected office and sort of, where did you get the chutzpah to put yourself out there? And, you know, it's, um, there are some really tough moments. Uh, and I also think that, um, and sometimes it can also be hard to get that press uh, sometimes I think you're not taken as seriously. It's kind of like, oh, she's a soccer mom, you know, and she's sort of doing her thing, and she really likes women's issues. I get that a lot. You know, you're really into the women thing, and, you know, and I see women's issues as our basic economic underpinnings, mm -hmm. and that when we're talking about equal pay, when we're talking about childcare, when we're talking about the cost of higher education, those are the bread and butter economic issues for everybody. And, uh, you know, that these, there's such, but it's still, there's still some of that going on. Uh, you know, one of my first appearances on a local TV show, I got asked about where I bought my suit. You know, and, and nobody else would have gotten asked that. And it wasn't like, 
They were trying to, they're being very complimentary. But I'm like, really? You've had every other candidate in this primary on. Nobody else got asked about where they purchased their clothes, which was TJ Maxx, just for the record. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Share. <laughs> yeah. Oh, taking That's risks, great. meeting the challenges. Linda, tell us about a time when you took a risk and it did not work out, and what did you learn from that? Oh, geez, great question. Okay, when I took a risk. Um, <clears throat> We take risk every day, right? I mean, when you stand out on issues, that's a risk. Um, when you file legislation, um, that's a risk. I will say that, you know, I, I took on an issue in, um, when I was in the House. So I was a state rep for eight and a half years. For the last four years, I was chair of community development and small business. So I came in with the lens um, of economic development working on small businesses. And there was an issue around um, SBLI. Remember us, we are, and that we serve together. <laughs> and so that was a Massachusetts chartered ins life insurance company. Um, and there was the whole debate. This was the only company in Massachusetts that was doing gender neutrality. Although women live longer, if you take life insurance, you know, you, you pay a little less and the men will pay more because, sorry, men, you, you don't live that long. <laughs> but we love you. But, uh, and so, you know, but again, SBLI is chartered in Massachusetts, Massachusetts company. Um, other insurances from around the country can come and provide life insurance here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but they were able to offer the different levels of payment, right? Mm -hmm. Except um, SBLI was not, took on that issue, was a battle, um, and it was really tough. Right, because the issue came out where folks were saying, well, we want gender neutrality, um, that if Thurgood Marshall you know, was alive, he would be rolling. You know, he, he would not believe that you're trying to do away with that. So there was a lot of discussions like that on the floor of the House. I mean, the, the woman, um, the representative who, who was on that side of the issue were good friends today. But it was really tough. And I have to tell you that we worked hard on the issue. It did not pass. Um, the first session, it went down in flames, actually. <laughs> but we did pretty well in terms of the debate, but it did go down. But then the following, so this was a defeat, but that you can't give up, right? So this is the whole point. You can't give up if you believe in an issue, if it's the right issue, if it's going to support small businesses here in the Commonwealth, if it's going to help this Massachusetts chartered company, I refiled the bill. And after tweaking it now, um, again, the person who was against it did not support it in the end, but working with Governor Patrick, you know, we were able to tweak it in a way where it was signed into law. But I would say that this is an issue where the gender piece came up and they were like, you know, you're harming women. And my whole point was, no, I, I can't be. I'm making it actually easier for women to get life insurance and to protect their families. If you're a low-income woman, here we talk about, you know, gender um, pay equity and really bringing equality on every dollar that a man makes, a white woman makes 77 cents, a person, a woman of color makes 64 cents, and a Latina woman makes 54 cents. And so if it's higher, let's say $400 a year for a man to pay for life insurance, we want a woman to pay $400. When we're saying, no, no, we live longer, let them do what the other companies do. So now the man will pay 400 and the woman will pay 200, which now makes it easier, right, and more affordable for women who may not have the opportunities to, to do that in the end. And so that, that's a piece where it was an, um, a defeat, but you never give up, right? And you turn it around and just do it again and bring more people to the table. And I believe in coalition building and bringing people that may not agree to the table to come up with a solution, so. Compromise and coalition building, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Jennifer, tell us, the Conservative Women for Better Future works to elect more conservative women to public office through the Recruit, Assist, and Train platform. What do the recruiting and training stages look like? This is how you guys all figure out how to get into office, I think, right here. <laughs> and how do you address the unique risks women face when assuming public leadership roles in your program? So, um, so just to be clear for anyone that you know wants to now you know I'm, I'm conservative I it, the organization is for women who are fiscally conservative and socially we don't actually discuss the issues oh, okay. um, so we kind of take them off the table oh. um, is someone not happy with that? <laughs> Let's be happy with that. That's good. That's a social <laughs> issue. That's good. That's good. 
because our feeling was that if we, the, the social issues are so personal that if we start talking about them, no one will ever agree. Everyone has their own view on it. And you came to your own conclusion because it's very personal to you. So we only focus on the fiscal conservative aspect of, of running. Um, and so basically what we look for is we talk to elected leaders and former elected leaders. We look for women from the hockey mom, the soccer mom, the woman who is paying for her education by working in the local restaurant, the you know, woman who is living in the town she grew up in and you know, either has her family there or she's working and still living, you know, living near her mom and dad or whatever it is. And so we're looking for people who really are connected to their community, exactly what you were saying. Someone who has those roots and those ties and is excited about do, making a change and, and going out there and really representing their district. Um, and then as far as the training, one of the things, and it kind of goes into the second point, which is in training them how to be good public speakers and, and good advocates for the causes that they want to support and that they believe in. It's also fundraising. And what's amazing, and I'm sure we've mm -hmm. all seen it and all felt it, but women for some reason don't know how to fund, they don't think they know how to fundraise. And you know, we can fundraise for, as a mom, we could fundraise for bake sales and for Girl Scout cookies and for the local you know, church or whatever it is. We're always raising money and we don't realize that we're doing it. We also have expansive networks. We have the people that, I did this, I did this little test and this is kind of how I came to um, form, forming conservative women. In the 2010 election, I was chairman of the state Republican Party. I was working 90 hours a week. I was never home, I was running around, but I was still able to drop my kids off at school, make it to the dry cleaner, head to the coffee shop, figure out an outfit to wear, pop into the local store, and so one day I said, I'm gonna do this test with my husband. I'm gonna see how many people over two week period he talks to and how many people over two week period I talk to, not including people at work. So I would drop them off one day, he dropped them off one day. I'd say, how many people you talked to today? No one. Did you see anyone? No. You didn't see anyone. Whole school. You didn't run into anyone. <laughs> nope. Didn't talk to anyone. Nope. So I would go. Like, I talked to 20 people in 15 minutes. <laughs> You go on with your day and you realize everywhere you go, I'm in a, I'm in a cab, I'm going up, the, up Beacon Street toward the state house, I'm talking to the cab driver about politics. I get out of the cab, I run into someone. So we as women, you have such expansive networks and you talk to everyone. And so when you're walking your dog and you're talking to someone and you say, hey, I'm running for office. I was you know, wondering <laughs> if I could hand you this. Always walk around with your card, always walk around with an envelope. And so that's one of the biggest things, I think, that, and the hardest thing to teach people is how to ask for money, how to be comfortable asking for money, and who to go to. You know, you start with your Christmas list. You start with the easiest people, and you move on from there. But, um, but that's something that I think every single one of us, you always run into. And when you see a new candidate, it's, you know, have you raised any money? Uh, I'm going to get to that. And it's really, it's a big, big problem, and it's something that, that every candidate needs to address. I agree. It's true. Very, Very important. Yeah. Thank you for putting it that way. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk public policy, Catherine, what public policy initiative are you most passionate about, would you say? Yeah, this is, uh, I have a little bit of ADD of public policy, so <laughs> I get very excited about many things. But, um, but really for me, uh, one of the policy areas I focus on is early education. And as I look at this country and our education system, and we have so much scientific data, we know that if we um, have kids who are coming into kindergarten ready to learn, and that they are reading at grade level by third grade, it is a complete game changer. Mm -hmm. And the more scientific data we get, the clearer it becomes. We really have to focus on the babies to age three and that we can close that achievement gap by the time they're four years old. And it's simple things that parents can learn. It doesn't take um, money or special training or high levels of education attainment, but it takes um, putting it together and making it a culture where everywhere we look, 
the, the basic learning and preparation of these young minds is it's being underscored that we're reading, that we're building vocabulary, that we're pointing, counting, um, and parents need to feel empowered that they have these skills, and we need to set our policies to really reinforce it. So it is, it is great for outcomes. We cannot afford, with our changing demographics, if you want to take the humanity aside, and I really feel that educational opportunity is what leads to opportunity in our country and what builds a strong ec economy. And if we continue to only provide an education based on zip code or family's financial ability, we are going to continue to fall behind the world. And there's nothing that says we remain a preeminent economy if we don't continue to work towards education, which to me is the, the pillar of our democracy. So that's the issue that I think, um, you know, that we can really, and we have a great business support for this businesses get it and uh, there's some really wonderful work going on in Massachusetts but it's uh, it's what really gets me revved up sounds great very good that's a good one I like that. <laughs> come on you guys <laughs> Thank you, Rich. it's perfect for an education environment too you know <laughs> um, Linda your policy platform reflects a strong and comprehensive commitment to the protection of the civil liberties of underrepresented groups, advocating for education access, health disparity reduction, anti-discrimination laws, low-wage workers' rights, community mental health care, criminal justice reform, and immigrant rights. Which three things oh. wow. Wow. <laughs> would you Thanks, prioritize <laughs> changing in the state of Massachusetts? OK, well, first. Thank you. That's a lot, isn't it? Okay, let's do this quickly. I would say, first of all, congratulations, Congresswoman, um, Congresswoman um, Clark, for her focus on early education, right? That is a big issue in terms of universal pre-kindergarten. Zero to five, as the Congresswoman said, is the most critical. I'm a mom of four, mom of three, right? Yep. Mom of three. And so we know the importance of that, right? It starts, babies young, you read to your child and so forth. And so it's quite interesting in terms of the population, in terms of the diversity, right? The incredible diversity we have in our state where you have families that come from different backgrounds and they speak different languages. And there is the piece around access access to quality early education. So that's something we're working on. Um, there was a big hearing that happened last week. Um, right at the State House to talk about universal pre-kindergarten in the Commonwealth. Second one would be economic development and opportunity. So the largest development that's taking place, it's in my district on the South Boston waterfront. How can we make sure that businesses that are owned by people of color and women, that they're at the table? One, construction jobs, yes, the diversity in construction jobs is important, but we have small businesses that are, whether it's law firms, architects, engineers, amazing small businesses here in the Commonwealth. 97, um, we have about 90, what is it? Let me tell you now, and I just lost it. It's, um, oh gosh, okay, let's forget it. But um, the uh, small businesses represent 97.8% of all employers and employ 46.3% of the private sector labor force here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But there is not equity in terms of the level playing field. So that is a big piece. There was the expansion of the convention center, put language in law um, to talk about access, to make sure that businesses that are owned by women, that people of color, that they're at the table, not just at the end in construction, but pre-development as well. And the final piece I'll say is very important is the social emotional piece in our communities and our neighborhoods. Um, there's a lot of issues. Um, there are 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and every community is different. But I can tell you that opiate addiction is one of the big issues we're facing here in the Commonwealth. Long time ago, people thought it was a city issue, an urban issue, because South Boston, in my community, um, for the last 20 years, people have been ODing. But we've seen that this has impacted everyone. Whether you live in the suburban, rural, you know, urban communities, people are being touched by substance abuse and addiction. So we have to tackle that issue. And that is where the social emotional piece comes into play and giving support in schools, right? And making sure that there are counselors that are there to, to really identify um, the children that may be having a rough time. But also making sure that we have the services available within our communities and our neighborhoods. Because it's not right to say if you have a family in crisis, 
you're going to go to a judge to sanction your loved one. So they could go to prison for 15 days to get detox. Mm -hmm. That does not make sense because we are the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So how do we detox people but give the step down beds and step down services that folks need, like the treatment facilities, like the residential um, beds in our neighborhoods where people can get healthy and well. So you know, there's a lot of issues you know, to tackle in the Commonwealth, but it's a great place. We have amazing bipartisan leadership um, in the state, and, and people are working hard. And so, that's, so those are the three so far. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Jennifer, how has being a woman impacted the decisions you've made in your career? <laughs> um, it's such a good question. So I'll start from, uh, I moved to Massachusetts 15 years ago, and I graduated from law school, and my husband proposed, and at, basically as he was getting up, said, so now you're moving to Boston, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that would be number one. <laughs> Um, I went to law school as a night student. I had had a career. I had an offer at a great law firm. And then I moved to Massachusetts. So I would say that that would be, number one, how it impacted. I wanted to get married. I was in love. And I moved here. So I left a life behind and started a new one. Um, started a new one. Thought it was all great working as a lawyer and um, was going to court in Worcester. Did not seem like a big deal driving from the North End to oh, Worcester. Oh. <laughs> that's easy, unless you have a newborn. And then you have to leave early in the morning, and you don't get home until late at night, and you don't see the baby the entire time. And suddenly, it grates on you for your first kid. By the time you get to number three, <laughs> you're like, ah. <laughs> you need me in Alaska? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Those poor kids at the end of the food chain. <laughs> um, better, all better for it. But it, so after my first, I had to reevaluate what I was doing and, and the career focus that I had in my practice of law. After my second daughter, I, when she was about a year and a half, I ran to be chairman of the Republican Party. And again, one of those, oh, this is going to be great until. A Republican in Massachusetts, we were at 10 percent. And so I had a lot of work to do, and I didn't realize how much I was not going to be at home. Mm -hmm. And so again, I was in this position, and um, I got a lot of flack for, you know, why aren't you at home with your kids, and mm -hmm. who's taking care of your kids? And I would look at guys and say, "You know, it's funny. My husband travels all the time. No one yeah. ever mm -hmm. looks at him and says, Who's taking care of your kids when you're traveling? And so, um, funny enough, I then got pregnant with my third. And um, I said, OK, I'm going to resign because we were going into a presidential election. Those same people that said, who's taking care of your kids and you should be at home Don't with your leave. kids, said to me, oh, so now you're going to go and you're going to leave and you're going to go have a baby? <laughs> like, yeah, and you're getting exactly what you wanted, right? I mean, so it's, it goes along with the whole kind of funny thing that we all mm -hmm. encounter. Um, but again, it was being flexible, you know? So I mean, I think that, that being a woman, how it's impacted my decisions. It's when I graduated from law school, I thought I'm going to be an ADA. I'm going to have this great career. I'm going to one day be elected to office. And everything was very rigid and set out. I, I'm, by the way, the first child. I'm type A. And so everything I planned out from when I was two years old. Um, and then you, <laughs> <laughs> you realize that life isn't like that. There are peaks and valleys. And there are trees that come in your way. And you, know, you have to appreciate everything it is. And, um, and so I think my decisions being impacted because I, I wanted them to. I, I didn't want the rigidity. I wanted more, flexibi more flexibility. I wanted to enjoy my kids. I wanted to be around. And then I also wanted my career. Well, we're so glad you did, because it's been nice having your voice part of the conversation Absolutely. here in Massachusetts. I know you have questions from the audience. I'm going to throw out two questions. You guys can decide who answers them while you approach the microphones. Please speak clearly. Remember, we are still live streaming. So my final questions for our panelists are, what would you tell your 22-year-old self today? And maybe someone can throw out three pieces of advice you'd have for our audience members. Don't all jump at once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was thinking about the 
what you would tell your 22-year-old self. And one thing I definitely would like to say to her is break up with him. Yeah. <laughs> There is someone better waiting in your future. And there you go. <laughs> he is the jerk you think he is. <laughs> a little, but take this in. Take this a in. A little bit back important. in time to myself. <laughs> um, yes, balance is important. Okay, then. <laughs> or your life partner. But, um, <laughs> but I, you know, my, um, my mom used to uh, say, and I say used to, she's still with us, but we are losing her into the fog of Alzheimer's. Oh, yeah. So okay. she is here, but... Um, but she always used to say, you know, you never doubt it when someone says they don't like you. Like, you absolutely believe that. You get a, a, a bad review at work, or somebody writes on your Facebook page, or we get some comment. You know, you, you take that, like, absolutely. That's the truth for that person. But when somebody says they love you, they like what you're doing, you're, you're good at something, we sort of... We brush that off and diminish it. And don't do that, you know? Take them equally. Uh, and if you think about it, you never, you know, you never doubt when someone is negative, but you really doubt that positive. Mm -hmm. And accept that as easily as you do the negative. I never thought of it that way. That's yeah. very well very said. Good. She's a very wise woman. Yes. <laughs> that is well said. Very, Ladies, very anything good. else? Yeah. I would say um, to absorb absorb everything, right? At 22, this is like 20 years ago, unbelievable. But, um, you know, you, you just take it in, right? And then really work on building relationships that, you know, even if you may not agree with someone, um, that you can't take it personal. You know, like Congresswoman Catherine Clark was saying, you know, it's not ever, it's never an attack, right? And so I would say is to absorb as much as you can, reach out of your comfort zone and meet with other people that may not come from where you've come, right? That may not have grown up in the community that you grew up in, or may not look like you. Um, and I think that's very important. Thank you very much. All right, so my quick three things are pretty much, two of the three I think are pretty much what they've said. So number one is to be strong. You know, social media today is something um, that oh, women before yeah. us didn't have Sorry. to deal with. Sorry. Don't read it. Don't read the comments about yourself. Don't read the nasty things. You have friends. You have family members. Those are the people who really know you. I always used to say, God, I have a friend from when I was five years old. If she's still my friend, I can't be such a bad person. Right. And I would mm -hmm. just keep saying that over and over to myself. I can't be so bad. <laughs> these people don't know me, and these women know me, and they love me, and I have family. So be strong and, and ignore the, the traffic noise. Um, the other thing is do what you like to do, whether it's running for office, being involved some other way politically, having a career in medicine or law or teach, whatever it is you decide to do, do it, do it with your whole heart. And if you're not enjoying what you're doing, go find something else that's more rewarding because mm -hmm. life is too short and as, um, the headmaster at my school's, my daughter's school just said, when you, when you hit the pearly gates, you know, they're not standing there. St. Peter isn't standing there saying, where did you go to college? Right. It is, it's what true. did you do with your life? Mm -hmm. And always think, when you die on your tombstone, what do you want to have written? And then the last thing, and these lovely ladies and Representative Kane are, are exempt from this, but also remember that Public, that public servants, that elected officials, work for you. Don't treat them as if they're superstars. These guys work their tails off. There are lots of people that don't do it. Make sure you hold them accountable. Ask questions, ask them what they're doing. Make sure that they are going to the 45 neighborhood associations. Um, and, and so be out there and really hold their feet to the fire because they keep going up in their careers because they want to do more for their districts. Representative Kane, same exact thing. If people are just staying there and stagnant, you don't need them. Toss them out, get new people. Well said. Thank yeah, you very much, well. ladies. We're going to open it up to our questions from the audience. Good evening. Tell us your name. Good evening. My name is Letty Smith, and I am a 3L at the law school. And I would just like to say thank you so very much for being here. And you've inspired us already. 
and we can go ahead and say we have the nine asks. We're all ready to run, I'm sure. <laughs> My question tonight is if a young woman knows that she wants to run for office and she knows that her home state where she has the most connections is not the best for her politically because she wants to win, not just run, what advice would you guys give to her when, if she selects another state on how to start a network from scratch? Can I see my yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. Wow, I mean, this is like, I think you looked at my bio. Um, so <laughs> I was actually on track. I was the next person. I grew up in New York. I was the next person to run for state assembly, and I left, and I moved here. And I'm a Republican in Massachusetts. Not only a Republican in Massachusetts, but to make it worse, I live in the city of Boston. So I mean, it was like, That's done. watch That's my <laughs> critical <laughs> aspirations. <laughs> um, so, so what do you do? You know what, you still do it. I mean, if you wanna run and you're not where your network is and where it would be the best place to run, I think it's, it's one, running for office and being involved are about the relationships that you make. Mm -hmm. So it is definitely about winning, but ultimately your heart has to be in the right place. You have to want to be there. You have to want to make the, the networks and the connections of the people that you're going to meet along the line. Because sometimes, even if you don't win, those relationships will outstand any elected career you would have. Absolutely, and I would say be ready to work, right? Absolutely. Because this is door knocking. It's grunt work, and you have to be willing to do it. And I think that, you know, there are amazing programs like the one Jennifer talked about. There's the Emerge program. There's the Women's Pipeline for Change. It's really getting women um, to really be interested in running, and they go from A to Z like you do. How do you raise money? How do you put a team together? But again, it goes back to the basics, right? Is this your heart in it? Why is it there? Why do you want to run? And, and be ready to work because nothing is granted to us. And I think a lot of times folks may decide to run for office and they think it's a shoe in right? And I think Jennifer, for giving plugs in terms of elected officials, we work hard, right? And you don't hear it all the time. You don't hear it in the press. And so just know that that's a big part of it. If you want to win, you got to be willing to knock on doors, roll up your sleeves, and listen to people where they are. And to be a listener, really, that's so important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would, yeah, I did not grow up in Massachusetts. And uh, I think it's really coming, there's got to be an issue that's driving you. There's something, or maybe several, that, you know, you, and form your community yeah. and your network around those issues, those values that are saying, I want my voice heard, I want to be at the table making these decisions because of whatever it is for you. And I think you'll find a community around that wherever you go. And I hope you stay right here in Massachusetts. Thank I'm you. <laughs> <laughs> and if I can add to that, wherever you start and decide whatever you want to do, have the young people that are around you, whether it's your children or your nieces, see what you're doing because right. it's putting that seed in the young mind that helps perpetuate you know, the success. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> vertically challenged tonight. <laughs> uh, my name is Anna Hagedorn. I'm a rising senior here at Northeastern. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I feel reasonably empowered, and I hope everyone else does as well. Um, my question tonight relates to your earlier statements about never really thinking about running for public office mm. as an illustrious goal initially in your careers. Um, I'm really passionate about certain issues and certain uh, policies that are being talked about on the national stage right now, but I've never really considered running for office as an option, um, as a vehicle for impactful change. Mm. Um, I think a lot of the time I'm, and I think I share this opinion with many people, skeptical of the political system as the fastest and most effective way to change something that I think is really important. And so my question for you is, do you feel like you're making more impact, having more of an impact in your current roles in policy and in politics than you did in the private sector? Um, I, you know, I, I do, uh, you know, I, I wasn't in the private sector all that long. I went to law school. I went and joined a big firm to, it was great for paying off, uh, student loans, but I quickly looked upward and said, I don't, I don't see the life I want. There were good people, smart people doing good work, but for me, I really wanted to be doing something that I felt made a difference. And I just never thought that would be elected office. And I think it doesn't have to be, but somebody's going to show up 
and take those votes. So why not you? You know, I don't know what your issue is, whether it's health care, environmental justice, criminal justice reform, women's equality, whatever your issue may be, somebody's going to be speaking for you. And if you feel passionately about it, why not be that person who shows up? It makes a difference and even in this Congress you know where it's so hard to get things done you know I just got a bill through um, unanimously in the house around the opiate epidemic issue mm -hmm. because like the opiate epidemic it doesn't it doesn't care if you're in a red yeah. state or a blue state it is you know an equal opportunity devastator and uh, so Mitch McConnell is my um, co-sponsor, lead co-sponsor in the Senate. We are a very unlikely couple. Um, <laughs> but uh, we both, unfortunately, have this tragic bond of this epidemic is devastating our states. But, you know, why not, why not be you uh, in that role, uh, making those votes, pushing those policies forward in a way that, that you can see and you have in your heart and your mind to do? Very good. Okay, so I'll say really quick, just to piggyback, I totally agree with Congresswoman Cloth um, that, you know, if you feel it in you, then you, you should run, right? And I would say this, that it's also important in terms of the different positions that we have in the public sector and in government, that we need people who are thoughtful, who are passionate, and that are going to be head and secretaries of these different agencies, right. that are going to be commissioners, that are going to be managers, because that's important as well. So public office and running for office may not be for you, right? And that's okay. But we need your skill set at the table in crafting legislation and crafting law, but really implementation. How do we get down and really help people, bring people out of poverty? making sure that folks have access to jobs. And so that's the balance that you have to figure out. But I would say again, it starts with you today, right? The communities in which you live. As students who live on Northeastern campus, there are all these organizations, student organizations. Get involved, right? Get involved. I mean, we have you know, the student government, right? The government and student body here. But it, it's getting plugged in into right now in college. So when you get out of here, you already have that in your blood, right? That, wow, I'm going to do this piece here. I'm going to get involved in my community. I'm going to show up. Just show up, and it'll make a whole difference. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank, you. Thank you. And in the interest of time, because oh, we want sorry. to hear from oh. all of you, when we'll you ask your question, time. maybe direct it to one person. you got to be brief, ladies. Yeah, be brief. Can. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Jacqueline Munson. I'm a 1L here at the law school, and I want to thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm a woman who plans to run for public office someday, so it's great to hear about your experiences and your advice. Um, so I'm a political and a feminist writer, and once I started writing and publishing, um, I had the experience of a lot of men in my life, um, you know, friends of mine, uh, family members, coming to me and asking how they can be good allies to women. So my question for you guys, actually, Representative Clark, if you could answer this question, what is your advice to men in this room and beyond who want to be allies with women? to ensure that we're empowered um, in the way that we deserve to be. Oh, wow. Good. good. <laughs> very, very good. Well, first of all, thank you. And that wasn't the story I thought you were going to tell, because I'm doing so much work on uh, cyber harassment against women who are speaking up on feminist issues, academics, journalists, and sort of the, so I am so glad that you have a community and people around you who want to support you. And I think it's really about don't forget you know, don't forget. Don't forget to look for that woman to bring up to the next position. Don't forget to include us at the table. And, uh, you know, I think that we are all, um, you know, we're in a wonderful community here at Northeastern that really puts a value on that. And I think it's up to us to take those values from Northeastern and, and bring them out. But, uh, you know, how wonderful that that was the response. That's Thank great. You. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Maria Ewing, and I'm a rising senior here at Northeastern. And uh, my question is for Linda. Um, so I know all of you touched on fundraising and campaign fundraising. And um, do you feel that the necessity to raise such high donation numbers kind of cuts out a group of voices from running for election? And how do you feel we can address the fact that 
the majority of those voices cut out of running are women because women are more likely below the poverty line. Okay, wow, great question. Marie, right? Maria. Maria, Maria, thank you. I would say that you know, we are in an environment where you have to raise money, right? That is part of the process. You have to raise money for campaigns and, and for putting out you know, the information in the brochures. Um, I can tell you that we have to get more confidence um, around that issue. Being in the public sector for eight and a half years before running for office, really almost 10 years before running for office, I worked for city government, so I took a leave of our absence, so I couldn't run, I couldn't ask folks for money myself, but I had a committee. But now, I am, I am, not, shamed, I am not ashamed to pick up the phone and dial for dollars, right? Because we need to do it to put money in the bank, to get our brochures out, but more importantly, to sponsor neighborhood events. So whether it's Little League, I, I would say I sponsor a lot of my little leagues, my nonprofits, they're having all these events. I mean, a lot of money, like $30,000 a year, easily. But I'm, the thing as women, and we kind of touched on this a little bit, we just have to remember that you know, we have men who are allies, but men are much better at raising money, no doubt about it. But we have allies who are men, and so they're raising money for others. So for me, I'm like, or you could raise money for me too, right? <laughs> and so I need you to raise me $20,000 because you're doing it for other people. And so I think it's really having the confidence at first, for the, I would say for the first, I've been elected now 10 years, but for the first five years, it was kind of like, oh my God, this is dreadful. I can't, I don't want to dial. Now, I sit down with my fundraising person and I will call everyone on this list so I could raise money for my district because it's not just about me and just building a campaign chest. We're doing a half day senior forum, right, to talk about Alzheimer's. My dad has Alzheimer's as well. To talk about Medicare and Medicaid, it's a half day. So I have to put that on, you know what I mean? I have to raise the money to do that um, through the help of my constituents and my friends. So I think that, you know, it's, it's tough. For me, where we are now, you have to raise money, so I don't have a problem with that, and I hope that you, know, you have to be willing, if you want to run, to ask. And it starts with your family and friends. Your family and friends have to be willing to invest in you, right? And you have, you have friends you're making here at Northeastern, and everyone's going to go on different careers, so it's being able to call them up and saying, I'm running, I need you to give me $200, or I need you to give me $500 again, or I need you to give me $10, right? It depends on someone's capacity, but anyone can donate, and it's being willing to take that step um, and saying, this is the campaign environment we're in. We can't say we don't want people to raise money. You know, that's not an equal playing field, at least I don't think. Um, so that's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, my name's Carly Balco. I'm a senior here at Northeastern and also president of the College Republicans, so kind of <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> can Thank feel you. for you guys. Yeah. Um, I really Thank enjoyed you. the discussion tonight. Thank you all for being here. My question is for Jennifer specifically. Can you just talk a little bit more about what inspired you to start um, your foundation for women? Was it like a single inciting incident or just kind of like with your work at the MASH GOP? Just a little bit more of the background on that, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually my favorite question to answer. Um, so while I was chair, I realized that it was getting men to run for office was so easy. I mean, I would show up and say, so would you? Yes, I will. What do I need to do? And then I would sit there with women, and I have one specific woman in mind who I absolutely adore. She is brilliant. She's wonderful. She ended up running for office. I had to ask her probably 12 times. I mean, I had to have her in my office, I had to go meet her, I had to meet her again, I had to like grab her during a snowstorm and not let her drive home. I mean, it was <laughs> ridiculous how many times I had to talk to her about it. I knew she wanted to, but it was really talking it through. And so when I left being chairman, I said the best thing I could do is be a resource for women and be the person who goes out and says, look, I have three kids, I know I haven't run for public office, but I was in yeah, this position yeah. where I fair. had to be in the media, I had to raise money, I had to do all the same things a candidate did, only thing, it was never ending. It was a never ending <laughs> campaign. And so um, I figured it was a good way to, to talk to women, to try to get them to come in. Um, and so that's, that's basically why I had started it because I had seen that it was so difficult to get women to run and, and we needed someone out there who was really focusing on women and women's issues. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, Elaine Webb from Reading, and I was a rising senior 30 years ago here. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, Elaine. <laughs> okay. 
So I, I, this question could really be answered by Catherine or Linda, I believe. So I have a big concern about how we're doing funding public education. And you both mentioned significant issues in public education. The early childhood education, how about kindergarten for all, which not all communities have, and the social, emotional, wellness, um, health. Uh, those, if you look at the resources we need to have in our schools in this state now to support guidance, counseling, uh, psychotherapy, and again, all those wellness and uh, you know, being able to have time for kids in the nurse's office for the other issues, the opioid issue, the number of resources that we have to have now to do that is like 30% higher than what it was 10 years ago. But we have to also give them AP Calc and AP Stats and AP Photography and AP Chem. So we can't do that with Chapter 70 the way it is. We can't do that with Prop 2 and a half. Businesses and bringing businesses into public education is important. Having public education across the state, neighboring communities collaborate is important. But we're, we're, we're just like dead. Can I ask what's your question? I'm sorry, we're running out of What are we going to do? Okay. How are we going to address that? How are we going to address that in Massachusetts? Well, but, yeah, I, I will just add the one piece. I think the federal government needs to step up. Yeah. You know, uh, states can only do so much mm -hmm. with their resources. The federal government, we have been, you know, we have sequester cap levels. We keep pulling back. And I think that we have come to a point where we no longer can tell the difference between spending. We hear so much about rampant spending, but we're forgetting that, you know, you have to make those investments and investments in education and infrastructure. Um, this is how we keep a strong economy going, yet you're seeing um, a House of Representatives right now that we are not putting any spending bills forward and we are on the brink of shutting down the government because we can't agree on a continuing resolution freezing all the budget numbers. We have to, we owe it as the federal government to the states, to our local communities to step up and do our part. Um, it, of course, there's going to be a partnership. There's room for public-private partnerships in all of this. But as the federal government pulls back, it, goes, it flows down to the states, and they simply cannot uh, provide the care, whether it's trauma-informed care that you talked about, making sure we're addressing the mental health needs of our kids, having school readiness. Um, there, we're seeing arts and, uh, and uh, you know, gym Back classes pulled out mm -hmm. of our schools. Music is becoming paid for only. And there is, of course, a role for the state, but the federal government uh, really has, has really put pressure down on the states.